You on next? You're all excited. I will be too. So this is a presentation which is based loosely on a paper. Um, and it was assessing the utility of historic data to guide um, the rehabilitation of Ranger. And I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors, Renee, Phil McKenna, and Chris Humphrey. Um, there's an outline of the talk. Uh, in the country on the next slide. Introduction of Ranger and the surrounds, even though I'm sure many of you have already seen a few talks on that. Uh, review of the historic data. And so, I mean, we're lucky in that it is an old mine and there has been a lot of work done. Some analysis of that historic data and then just some conclusions uh, where we got to and possibly why we've done certain things the way we have. So um, I'd like to acknowledge um, and pay our respects to the traditional owners of both um, the Mira people in uh, Kakadu National Park, uh, Larrakia, uh, Larrakia people in Darwin, and also the Turbal and Jagra people in the Brisbane regions where we conduct our research and uh, monitoring and acknowledge elders past, present, and emerging. So uh, I think I stole this from maybe one of Jay's um, presentation. Um, Mira country, uh, as you know, uh, Ranger is in, as most of you know, Ranger is inside uh, the Alligator Rivers region and um, it was in the Magella Creek um, catchment particularly. And uh, that is um, obviously you've heard it's World Heritage Area, um, very important for multiple botanical um, faunal and cultural reasons. So it has a lot of focus at this conference, not surprisingly. Um, so as you also probably know, the uh, requirements for that mine are that the revegetation of the disturbed sites need to use both local species uh, that are similar in density and abundance to that in the adjacent areas. Now this is a um, diagram of uh, both the Alligator and Rivers region and a lot of the vegetation survey plots or all of the survey plots that have been done in, well, pretty much the last 40 years. So starting in um, the Conservation Commission work in the 70s um, through to, uh, I guess, the last large survey, um, which was done in the Georgetown area. And so that's sort of the layout. And uh, historically, uh, there's been some attempt to aggregate all that data. And so we decided to tease that apart a bit. So when, when we compile that data, it falls into uh, the stuff that's um, available um, into five main pieces of work. Um, first, it was the Conservation Commission. Uh, so the work was done in the late 70s, early 80s, published a few years later. Um, the design, we're not sure of how they designed it, but um, they did a 50 meter radius. Um, they didn't collect understory, mainly overstory. It was about looking at land units. Um, Kim Brennan uh, published in 2005 a report, but that data was actually collected in the early 90s. And that was stratified random, um, had uh, both understory and overstory, uh, quite a complex mix of uh, randomization within single hectare plots. Um, and on the far right, I have within 10 kilometer radius or the area that I guess we consider similar, um, only about 35% of his plots were uh, within that range. Um, Ian Hollingsworth and Ingrid Meek in 2002 uh, did 20 in an area called Georgetown. Um, they both, they uh, did some, um, stratified systematic sampling. That was all within, they did some other story. Um, there was work done for Cyclone Monica and then a 2010 survey, 54 plots and it was stratified random. And uh, Chris Humphreys wrote, wrote that up in 2011. Again, uh, only in the overstory. So in the, in the background, um, the work uh, at um, er, um, ERA, um, particular Ian Hollingsworth uh, looked at 
uh, for natural landforms in the area and determine whether they were um, similar in size and composition. And in that time, they were talking about a, a 500 hectare size uh, disturbance area. And so after all this modeling, which went on, um, erosion, wetness, slope, uh, topography, and looking at, they were in the hexagons in those days, um, they uh, found an area right beside the mine called Georgetown area, which was the area that they determined to be most similar to what the final landform would be. And so concentrated um, much of the work on vegetation surveys more recently there. And uh, this is the Georgetown area. And um, for a number of reasons in, in that the most recent survey, which was 2010, um, was the most comprehensive, uh, also had biophysical factors, LIDAR data, uh, we, we determined that that was probably the best data source uh, for working out what similar was. Um, and so we assessed that more fully. Um, so going back, uh, so the land units, as you know, most of these sites, they do have uh, vegetation mapping that um, is done. In this case, we've had two. So um, on the left-hand side, we have the Magellan land units, uh, which came from that initial work in the 70s, and then the Shodi classes, um, vegetation classes, which were more recent. There are different scales, one's at one to 50,000, the other one was done at one to 60,000 and upscaled to one to 100,000. Um, interestingly, you know, the, the land units, um, the Magellan land units are far more detailed, not surprisingly, have higher detail, um, but they don't always line up. Um, there's a number of different land units on the actual mine footprint, uh, which shady classes uh, didn't map in the same way. So to look at how, how good is that vegetation mapping um, for guiding your restoration work? And we compare that also to the data collected from those sites later on to see if they align. Um, when we look at those uh, 54 plots, they fall out into three major groups. Um, at a, um, a nominal uh, similarity index. And it comes down to, you know, Melaleuca woodland, a low open forest and open forest as um, which fall into similar groupings within um, both the vegetation mapping units. Um, now, not surprisingly, uh, the proximity to the waterways was um, a key driver of um, the differences in those vegetation groups. And you can see within the Georgetown area, that's just an overlay of um, the topography. And so generally, and this is, you know, that's what happens when you average, um, you know, the, uh, the uh, different forest communities um, are st statistically different overall, even though, you know, on an individual basis, they can be closer uh, to waterways. So uh, they fall out uh, and the main framework species there because this was uh, just on the woody framework species that it was determined. Um, Maloca vertiflora and pandanus define the Maloca woodland in the Georgetown area, whereas low open forest, uh, Eucalyptus tectifica um, versus the open woodland, which is tetradonta dominated. Uh, now tectifica, we don't see too often. So that's, um, in relative terms, an unusual uh, community uh, in the surrounds. So that's what uh, defined those particular groupings. Um, exploring that data a bit further, and, uh, and obviously, you know, there's continuing work. We, we looked at the, um, the species that were in the list of woody species to look at how much we knew, um, like had they actually been uh, germinated, what was the best way to um, grow them, and then has their growth been demonstrated on degraded lands? And for a large proportion, um, you know, there's limited knowledge of, um, of how to actually get them, even though, you know, there's some uh, well-known genuses there, um, they're not always that easy to collect. So there's definitely uh, gaps in our knowledge of species that are common uh, and, you know, in reasonable abundance about how they might perform on um, mine sites. And that was um, by Sean Belair's helped us with that. 
the other aspect was that um, we obviously the fire frequency in the region um, is you know a long-term disturbance regime the uh, and across um, Kakadu it's changed and increased in frequency over time we looked at the 30-year um, that's you know, 30 years prior to the actual vegetation survey being done and uh, we actually and compared that of the Georgetown area to the surrounds um, and using a t-test of um, pixels pretty much uh, found that the range of buffer area excluding um, the Georgetown analog um, was significantly different to the Georgetown area so the Georgetown area had much lower fire frequency than um, than the other areas around um, around the mine and some of that may be you know distance from Jabiru, uh, depending on how uh, fires are lit um, and overall um, a significant difference to the surrounds per se. So from all that, I guess the, the conclusions, I mean, the rehab methods um, need to create vegetation similar to surrounds and the vegetation surveys that have been done, um, they partially reflect um, the existing vegetation maps. As I said, they're not, not perfect. But, uh, they also reflect some of the biophysical conditions um, in, in that obviously, you know, distance to waterways was a big driver. Uh, they do provide a woody species list and, and that forms the basis of the mine uh, rehab plan. They have a diverse fire history um, and, and internally in Georgetown, um, they're not significantly different, um, but external to the uh, buffer region it is. And it does also give us an uh, indication of woody species abundance that are required um, or thought to be similar to surrounds. So I guess uh, to account for that uh, variability in fire histories, um, the range of plots was recommended uh, to capture that un un unevenness. And um, Lorna, I think we'll talk a bit about why that uh, intersected with our sampling uh, regime later. So, I guess the key opportunities, because not only conclusions, but, um, and no doubt Meg and others are now pursuing this, and there's definitely a lot more work to do, but um, how the, as, as the rehabilitation goes ahead, it's demonstrating the growth and survival of, uh, and the potential for many of those species. And the identification of additional understory species that can persist on mine landform, and ultimately create a post mining landscape that is acceptable and enjoyed by Mira people in the long term. And so I'd like to acknowledge probably the people that actually collected the vegetation data, which is actually the hard work. And um, there's the paper um, if you want to look further. Thank you. Well, that is great. So you're welcome to ask me any questions. Um, and I can do a roving mic at the same time. Otherwise, you have to go. Otherwise, we have a very long break. There's one. Uh, Craig McDonald from the Northern Land Council. You mentioned uh, at the end there, and we've heard in a number of other presentations today, the, uh, the role of the traditional owners and uh, the importance of engaging them. And I was just wondering if you could provide some comment on that uh, in relation to this process and uh, uh, you know, on, on the um, processes that you um, followed to engage them and, um, and the importance of that, if you, if in, you don't mind. In this particular, um, the, the only engagement would have been um, at the RTEC board um, where Chris Brady is the representative for this analysis of the existing um, vegetation data. Yeah, they're good talk. <laughs> um, how much you, much of your uh, you've used historical sampling data, uh, stretching back a fair bit of time? How much historical change has there been in the plant species composition, and what does that tell you about the future? That's a good question, John. Um, I'm not sure we've explored it um, that far. Um, I, uh, as far as re so 
because they're all single sort of, it's very hard to compare uh, between, I guess, a single samples uh, sort of what the actual change is. So possibly the, uh, that's an unknown from this data set, I would suggest, because no one's gone back to sample them more than once. So you'd have to aggregate. And um, I, I guess there are other data sets from Kakadu, notably the Russell Smith fire plots, where there's demonstrated that there has been substantial change in plant species composition over time related particularly to fire regimes. So I guess you, you've got to contextualise your data in that it's a highly dynamic system and the plant species composition is variable over time. Thank you.